aren't able to implement it because of the type of work that they do, of course, and depending on the service, you know, if we're talking about hospitality, we all know that the impact of hospitality um, or the impact of COVID on hospitality has been just decimating. That's really challenging to watch. So anyway, um, I just showed you, I just told you there that we are currently on the hybrid working approach. Um, and then on the 2nd of December, we'll be doing the effective leadership um, uh, actual course. And then that will follow up with the self-care for leaders and their teams. Really, I, I encourage you guys to jump on those ones because um, we get really sort of, I love interaction. I love people to ask questions and I do encourage that. So please do. I've kind of done the intro to myself already. So I am JP. I'm one of the directors of Core Impact. Um, and just a wee bit about what we do. And I thought I'd summarize it um, in this way. And basically, we do, we support organizations to, just to create that culture of psycho, uh, psychological safety. And that helps people align with the company objectives. So it's a win win for everybody. Again, tonight, what we're going to specifically focus on is some tips for hybrid working, just ideas around the, the approach. And um, if it's for yourself or for a team that you're managing, um, we'll make sure that we uh, focus a little bit on that. Call, call me out and ask me some more tips because um, I was only able to condense some in here. Um, I actually give one example throughout this as well, which will be you know, a, a platform that we use, which is really, really simple and effective. Um, uh, so much so actually, I was working, as I say, on one of the classes this week and my, my colleagues were saying, actually, we've never come across that. And it's a Google product, like, so it's, and it's free, it's simple to use. So we'll look at that as well. We'll look a little bit at company culture and how the hybrid approach will impact the company culture. Um, but I think it's important to do a little bit of overview on culture anyway, because of course it will, because that's what we do. <laughs> um, and just high teams will work together moving forward. Um, so let's move into it. Um, the hybrid working approach. So the first thing that I would say around the hybrid working approach is it's kind of work are based upon um, this sort of idea of where are we going to work, whether that's in the office or at home um, or uh, how are we going to work? So like in, in which way will we work? Will it be together? Um, and I mean that in the sense of are we working together remotely? Or are we working together in person? Um, and then also when you're working on your own, whether or sorry, together in groups together. I keep saying together. Sorry, I'll, you'll, I'll, you'll see what I mean in the next slide. <laughs> um, together in site, on site um, and then remotely as well. OK, so. Has anybody, can I ask, um, I heard a few examples there, but um, is everybody working remotely or do you have the do you have the opportunity to work remotely as well as in, in place? I know obviously with Glandor, being members of Glandor, or if you're not a member of Glandor, it might be different. You know, of course you'll have offices there, but I, I would like to know a little bit more about that. Well, it's James here. So I'm full time in the office. Um, yeah. We we started building this operation in August this year. So from scratch, and um, this is a new location for for our organisation. So yeah, part of the the remit and the, and the strategy plan was to certainly first through the first six months is to have everyone on site and build that culture and the brand and awareness. You know, the training and onboarding, do all that yeah, because yeah. we had had some difficulty in my previous organisation onboarding new staff. Um, you know. Okay. The follow rate was higher for sure. Right. Um, right. So we, we, you know, we didn't uh, see the ramp um, as quick remotely, just to the nature of our business. Okay. Um, so moving to this new company, it was definitely something that you know senior leadership we talked about, you know, incorporating an, an on site, even if that meant that that would maybe uh, lead to a, a longer recruitment process, because obviously we wouldn't be a catch all for for candidates. Yeah. Um, but we found that that was going to be the right strategy for us for the first six months anyway. Okay. And are you saying that it was because of the remote onboarding that was where there was issues with turnover? Very much so. We felt that people didn't feel part of the, our brand identity, the company. You know, okay. the, um, the, the one, the, the, there was a, a small number of people that did onboard in office. And, you know, the feedback yeah. from those guys was they felt more in tune with the company culture, the values, and, and you know, our, our, our mission, oh, what we're okay, trying to yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. But, okay. Now that's interesting, and that, that is something I'll talk about. But I'll uh, I've got a slide here today which talks about the, the employee journey and and how you know you're trying to if you're looking at stakeholder mapping, if you look at employee mapping, which are stakeholders of course, but you know the idea around how do you include them, um, and as you said there, they didn't the, the people who were onboarded and they got the opportunity to be in the office, they felt more included. 
and look, I, I don't think there ever is truly, and I, I'm speaking from a facilitator's perspective, you know, even lecturing online, it, it's really challenging. And, and the problems are technology, of course, and the, the ability to use it, but also just how to use it charismatically, how do you use it in a way that people um, feel that they're included? And then, of course, from a leadership perspective, you know, you may be good at it, but the team might not be good at it. And so what I wanted to do is I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on just around, you know, um, I mean, there's a slide as well, of course, about remote working specifically and some top tips around that, but some generic hybrid working tips that I've got around uh, recruitment and the idea that how can you use the best of both worlds? And essentially that is what it comes down to, isn't it? You know, hybrid working and I heard one or two examples there of, you know, the, the, the aspect of it's been great for me. It's been great for me because I've been able to do X, Y, and Z. And that's what the opportunity, where the opportunities lie, you know, um, and you can align that with the company objectives as well. So it's important to understand that um, many organizations, of course, are going to want to see their people in person, but with COVID restrictions in place, and now the way things are going the way in the North anyway, that it looks like um, we're going to have to get more restrictions in place. People are start, starting to scratch their heads a wee bit more in this topic of hybrid working is, if it hasn't impacted you now, which is very unlikely, um, but if you're only really starting to come around to the idea, look, for the success and the, the longevity of the business, and um, we're going to have to figure out a way forward. Yeah, I try to consider that in some of these sites. Um, but that's really interesting for me to hear, James, um, and hopefully we can cover a little bit around that um, for you. Again, no one size fits all, um, and you have to take everyone's uh, background into consideration and whatever, and that's why it's such a big topic, isn't it? Um, so look, Breaking these down a wee bit. When I say at work, okay, that's the literal sense of, are you working at home? And if you're working at home, are you working on your own? Are you working within teams? Because if you remember um, back when, when we all worked individually and we never worked at home, unless some of you did, um, I know I did sometimes, um, the idea around that sort of independent learning and the, the sort of synchronous working alone attitude Sometimes people are really good at that. If you think back to some of the interviews that you would have whenever you're going for jobs and they say, are you, you work well part of a team um, or, or individually? And, you know, as uh, depending on the type of work, but largely you're hoping they can work well as part of a team because most things you're working within teams. Um, but some of the challenges that I've found around that sort of uh, working from home within that, that distributed uh, type of, of sort of working, um, I've seen that people initially and even up to this point don't have a full office setup i'll tell you one of the learners that i have you know he doesn't have a great uh, environment to work within but unfortunately he's fully remote um, and he just has to get on with that but speaking to him i can tell you that his productivity um, and this is from his experience and he's telling me it, that his productivity isn't as good as it could be but it is what it is and he has to deal with it excuse me so how do you how do you remedy those sorts of things especially working at home um, well, providing the workplace, a workspace that actually works for them. Um, you know, I've actually heard, uh, you can tell me if you've heard of this as well. I've heard of a couple of um, organizations, and this is why Glandor is so good. Um, you know, some organizations engaging with the likes of Glandor um, and James and Mary, you could maybe give me some examples if this has happened to you, where, you know, maybe somebody isn't capable of being able to work from home. So they might have a bit of a sort of a singular unit or a space that is away from everybody else and um, that they can work within. Is that something you've come across before? Well, I had I had one person, um, I think her, her partner had had long COVID. Um, yes. So, you know, I, I'd looked at that, but um, it, it just wasn't suitable for the office that we're in the minute. However, you know, we, we, we onboarded her remotely because of the skill set she had and, you know, very experienced person. So it was worth that, um, worth that hire. But, um, you know, we, we'd explored two or three different options to try and make it work for this person. But, um, and they end up, you know, they were able to, you know, facilitate a work from home and we, we you know, looked at their equipment set up and did all of that stuff. So they were more comfortable in there in their home environment. Yeah. Okay. Good. And I think just with that, this slide, obviously mentioning the likes of equipment and, and the environment and the space that, at which they work in, I think that's really important that you're providing that as leaders. Um, it, anybody else, have, were, were you given support around that? Were you given the, the help that you needed? Or work, if you're working on your own, did you take the time and invest 
um, in sort of a desk or a, a new laptop even, or even a second screen, because I know I did. <laughs> I'll just say from, from a Glander point of view, uh, we didn't really do remote work before COVID happened, before we were all sent home that day in March. We'd, we'd do it the odd time, but people just weren't set up. But our, our IT team were fantastic and got everyone set up. We were mostly working all from laptops anyway, so it was a very quick transition. But our yes. ops team as well were like, listen, if you need a table or if you need a proper office chair, they would bring it out to us. So they were fantastic. And then we kind of extended that out to the Glandor members as well, that if people wanted to get their chair from their desk in their office, we try and arrange to get it out to them. So just, you know, we know it wasn't going to be a week long thing. So you want people to be as comfortable as possible. Yeah, yeah, and that's fantastic. That's it's, it's excellent that you were able to offer that, especially with the, the type of business model that you guys are when you're you're uh, providing space for people to work in. And the example that I was referring to was I've came across a few people who they just said it, it, they they prefer not to work at home if they can, and that they got a special circumstance where there was certain if it was um, the likes of organisations like yourselves or even business parks where you know you can or you can organise just to have a one kind of desk set up where it's separate to everybody else um, and I found that that was actually really forward thinking um, so Emer since she just has to drop off there um, it, this is recorded Emer so no problem at all you can watch it back and, and that's no issue at all so thank you very much for letting us know and I appreciate you um, coming on the call Le lovely learning a wee bit about you um, so you know for us when we're working with organizations especially hybrid working organizations, the, some of the challenges are the, the aspect of how do you get people to work together, both at home and working uh, together while in the office. And of course, then you have to take into consideration the COVID restrictions itself, you know, obviously keeping people distanced, uh, making sure, do you need to wear a mask when you're walking about? What sort of environment is it? You know, some organizations actually use the attitude where you know, you're in the office one week, you're at home the next week. Um, and, and again, there isn't one size fits all. But what I do know is from a leadership perspective, if you're trying to lead teams and, and create that environment and that culture that people feel included, um, it's really challenging. And I find that, and I have some tips as we go on here, but I find that if you simply build on the relationships that are there, I find that if you take the time to sort of speak to people individually, see what's going on at home, you know, a lot of people sort of, I mentioned the hospitality industry earlier, and, um, you know, a lot of people actually left that industry, obviously because they couldn't get work, but also because there were some uh, people I know, family members and friends and, and colleagues who I used to work with who decided to leave the industry, even when it was open partially. And um, one, because of stability, but two, because they thought actually working from home suits me down to the ground. I've got a CURS responsibility. I've got the attitude where I want to just walk my dog at lunch and, and create a wee bit more self-care. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about self-care, but with another workshop that comes from it, you know, and, and it's so it's about creating the, the space available for people in, in the sort of the infrastructure perspective, the tangibles. OK, and then just off the back of that, then as well, like I said, this asynchronous you know, working together and working apart together, if that makes sense. So whether you're using the platforms like Teams, you're using Zoom and uh, you're using Google Meetups. Um, again, I'm not a pro on them, but I've used them all. Um, I've seen what works for me, what's, uh, what I think is, and you can all tell me whether you have your favorite or not, but I find it's whatever is most simple and um, something that gets the work done when you need to speak to people. Um, but the synchronous, the, the working alone part, that's where it's interesting, okay? So when you come to the hybrid working model and you're saying, right, well, how do I, how do I actually as a manager or a leader, how do I create an environment where when someone's working together, it's not the same, or alone, sorry, it's not the same as when you're in the office and you can just walk past and sort of nip your head in and sort of go, how are you getting on? How's things? You know, I know you're working on a project, you're working on this part alone. You know, I know a lot of managers find it really, really difficult and still do actually, because there isn't a one size fits all approach. Um, and it's just trying to figure out what ways to get around that. And one of the, some of the, I've got some tips on the next uh, slide here around that, but, but has anyone, has anyone in the leadership role where they are overseeing people firstly? Yeah, I am. Yep. Okay, Jim. So see in the scenario where you, you know, what, what, what way you think that in terms, how many people are in your team? Uh, 24. 24. And what, can you tell us what way you manage that? How do you check in with people? 
we're all we're all in office with the exception of one. Oh, okay, um, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yep. Um, for for a few months. Um yes. now. Brilliant. That will so, that will change, yeah. I keep talking about you. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um so see in the scenario, did you mention with the exception of one person, was it? Yeah. Okay. So what what do you do with that one person? Well, if there's if there's a team meeting, you know, instead of having everyone around a table, we'll all join teams. So we'll, you know, we've made a conscious decision not to try and leave anyone out, whether it's one right. person or ten, you know, so we'll all join our, our, our teams meetings or Zoom meetings at our desk yeah. um, and do things like that. If there's any socials or anything that's gonna happen, you know, we make sure that person's invited, training materials all shared over teams and just trying to collab because ultimately trying to build a structure that when we go to more than one person remote that we have it there. But no matter how big or small, we didn't want anybody trying to feel isolated. Now yeah. That's I can say that now, but that wasn't always the case. You know, if, you know, a year ago when we first went to this, um, a lot of those mistakes were, were made. So we're, we're kind of you know doing this as a second attempt, yeah. um, in this company to um, to, you know, as a learning of what what went before. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, it's it's interesting to hear that. So uh, I've come across that before, where people kind of uh, had issues with engagement with their team because you know I've I've seen the attitude where. Um, and I don't know anyone can tell me if they've done this, right? So I've seen scenarios where some people are in the room physically and some people are on a Zoom call with a screen. Have, has anyone come across that before? Yeah, pretty much so. Yeah, and, and did, did you move away from that just simply because you didn't find it was effective then? It's not. So we just we did the segregation of just everyone at their, at their screen until there's a point where everyone's in, which yeah. isn't very often. Yeah. So it's, it's, do you know what it is in, in practice or sorry, in theory, it's really good, but in practice, it's a nice idea in theory, but it's in practice, it just doesn't work because unless everyone's so tuned in, you know, if, if it's an environment where everyone understands the technology completely, you know, uh, and they are comfortable with the dynamic of looking at a screen where somebody has something to say, but the problem even with that is, you know, if technology fails you, which happens, um, I'm telling you, I have internet issues. You know, if there's internet issues, thankfully it's holding off. Well. Um, if there's internet issues, you know, that kind of puts you out altogether. And I know I definitely had issues with that last year. Thankfully, this is a one off, but, you know, we had major issues and it, it impacted. I can see somebody jumping in now, jumping in. Um, it impacted how we uh, we ran our business. Uh, it really, really impacted us. And it's, it's demotivating whenever the technology isn't working. So it's interesting that you've taken that approach now where everyone agrees to be at their desk on the screen and therefore there's a um, a singular approach. And I would I would recommend that. I think that depending on your team, of course, read it on the team and it depends on who you're working with. Excuse me. But um, what I find is if you take the time to have that one approach, one every one person approach and um, sitting at their desks when it's a remote call, then that makes sense. Now, in the scenario where you need to try and do some sort of team building. That's a wee bit different. Obviously, if you're meeting outdoors, if everyone's available, again, that presents its challenges because some people may be quite anxious and they may have current responsibilities. Like I said, you know, they may be high risk, especially with COVID. Um, and it's just striking that balance. It's trying to strike that balance off, you know, what type of event are we going to do that includes everybody? You just go with it and get a consensus and that if you get 80% or more of the, the population of the team saying that they're happy to go and then you try and work something out with the, the, the 20%, you know, it's, it's, it's watching what works for your team. So when you're actually leading teams remotely, we have found that there's a couple of key th thoughts that we have on that, okay? So um, yes, of course, remote working is challenging when they're working alone, but just have regular meetings. And when I say that, I mean individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with people, or even if you don't want to call it a meeting, to try and take a bit of the, you're trying to bridge that gap between the, the water cooler conversations. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice if you're back at the work in, in, in the working environment and you're, you're finding that everyone's there and you, you just feel a different sense of energy, don't you? You can't really achieve the same energy unless you're in person. But you can, get, you can get close if you have the right technology and everyone knows how to use it. But what I would say is when you're checking out in, do that, don't check up. So, you know, if it's a case software, and I was, that's why I'd ask James, and, um, you know, how does it work? How many people do you have in your team? And, and, you know, I've heard of quite a few examples of, you know, with 24 in the team, say, for instance, taking your example, and 12 of them are currently at home, 12 of them are in the office, and they rotate. Um, and it's basically how do you how do you work with that? How do you keep a continuity of motivation of people communication wise staying in tune with what's going on? 
Um, and I can tell you, even at the best case, and we all know this, well, most of us should know it, um, you know, communication is the number one issue in most organizations, effective communication, that is. Um, and so, yes, Sandra, go ahead. Unless you accidentally hit the hands up button. Oh, sorry, <laughs> JP, I was trying, I was having difficulty coming off mute there. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, that's a really good point about the check-in, don't check up. So for me, what I, what I did actually when within a couple of weeks of us all being uh, remote, what mm -hmm. I do, and I still do it once a week, I literally just, we, we use MF Teams. So yes. I literally just ping my entire team every week, but I don't talk about work. Like I check in with them yes. and like it's the way you find out that somebody's mom has fallen at home and they've got a broken arm and yeah. you find out so much just by checking in rather than and it's not about work like it's just for me to see how everybody's doing and yeah. you know that type of thing so it's a really good point and I think if we can you know and it literally takes two minutes but it, it means a lot to people uh, look absolutely you know it, it comes down to your leadership styles but I can tell you that coming from a leadership and management sort of background um and, and that is a lot of the consultancy we do that what you're just what you're referring to there is the sort of emotional intelligence elements of it you know like taking the time to build real relationships with your team um and you know some of the work we were getting at the start which again a lot of it dropped off because um team people were just worried about uh spending and they were losing people and whatever right but one of the things that we found was the organizational leaders who didn't take the time before the pandemic to build up proper relationships with their current teams because of course like james mentioned there with onboarding and i'll mention a wee bit about that as we go on you know um if you didn't already have a good relationship built up with the majority of your team then whenever you get into a remote setting it became even more challenging and awkward because when you're jumping on a call especially when i'm saying do these one-to-one -one calls and, and inevitably you'll have to at one time or another with people you know, there was no rapport, there was no uh, similarities. Um, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's about taking the time to, to build those relationships. Now, it can still be done remotely. It, there are some really nice ways of doing it. And again, I've used one example of a platform that I think is really good, but I'll talk around a few of my own experiences and, and ways to do it. But, you know, use the tools and the platforms that are there. And um, again, with that, um, in performance leading, you know, when you're trying to perform, uh, when you're checking in on how people are getting on with work, um, lead with what Sandra said, start with the higher you, higher things. And it is an opportunity as well, because, you know, a lot of leaders were saying to us, well, we didn't know our team members all that much. We just came to work, we got the job done and we left. But now it's a case of, you know, they're working in a different environment. I'm not very good with technology. It's awkward as it is. I don't know the person very well. And I said, well, you know what? You've all got one thing in common. You know, we're all being impacted by the pandemic. We all have the, the unique challenges that we, we've found come along with that, you know, working from home with your children, especially when students were off, you know, bridge the lines of communication and go back to the fundamentals, you know, go back to those soft skills element. Um, you know, automation, automation is a thing that is coming out. Uh, it has been about, you know, but they're saying by 2030, there's a huge percentage and multiple industries that will actually be, jobs will be lost to. Um, the automation element of AI and uh, technology in general. But what, what I would say is AI can never only simulate emotional intelligence and build in those, that rapport with your team. So soft skills, things around building real relationships, feelings, you know, you can only ever simulate that. It'll never truly connect the way we do as humans. So take the time. It's the one thing that stands out. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, Focus on outcomes, not activity. So when you are working with your team, try and be flexible um, and manage and manage expectations effectively. You know, so sometimes it's easier to get things done when you're in the office. So you're going to think about that and be flexible and say, right, I think that when we're in the office here and we're working collaboratively, we may get more done. Right. That might not be always the case, but if it's at home, you know, if especially when somebody's not used to the technology or they're not very good at the technology. Um, you know, try and be mindful of that and build on those relationships that I'm talking about and say to them, look, what, what support can I give you and, and provide for you in order for you to feel included? Try and prevent burnout. Burnout, I'm sure we've all felt it at one time or another. I definitely have, um, you know, overwhelming feelings, not having a really good work-life balance. 
Um, and, and I think it's important that I mention this actually on another, another slide actually I just released um, about self-care in general. Take the time to, to provide support for your team, for yourself as well. Um, try and make sure that your team, especially in that remote setting, excuse me, are dependent on their lifestyle. They might have five kids. Three of them might be, or two of them might be still at home and that, and that might be the case. You know, so trying to create that balance you know, I remember seeing a statistic last year, and I haven't seen the updated version, but I know that certainly between 2019 to 2020, on average per month, um, you were finding that people were doing at least 24, 28 hours of overtime. Um, and that's well and good, but when that starts impacting your, your work-life balance, there's, there's issues. And um, so try and encourage that. Consider time management. So what, I hope you all do this anyway, but if you're remotely working with teams, Make sure you're taking the time to tell them that they should block out calendars. And again, even for that healthy lifestyle stuff, you know, I've seen really positive examples from organizations that are saying, actually, you know, we're not going to be too strenuous when it comes to holding you down for between nine and uh, five thirty. And take the time or take 45 minutes a day if you need to, or 30 minutes a day that you need to for yourself. Um, and if you provide that opportunity, that will work really well and tell them to block it out in their calendar. And the reason why it's important to do that is because see if you block it out in the calendar, you won't feel guilty about it when you do it. You know, you're allocating time to that. Now, obviously you can, you can change it, but I would, I would suggest that if you put it in the calendar, like most of us, it's not going anywhere unless there's a very, very good reason. And the other thing is the onboarding, right? Now I'm saying hi to, but there isn't one size fits all, but like James said, you know, in his last organization, they found that it just wasn't effective. Um, it can be effective. I've actually seen it, where, where we pulled for examples from were, you know, the multinationals, the sort of CME groups of the world and PWCs of the world who would have been used to onboarding remotely anyway. And I think it's important to look at those examples. Um, you know, just for argument's sake, and you've probably seen this, but the, the, the likes of the, the Amazons of the world and um, uh, Apple and Facebook and you know they provide the opportunity for their uh, teams to re fully remotely work so they've considered the onboarding process and um, so one of the easy ways and simple ways of doing that is provide it a buddy for somebody you know whether that's you, obviously you've got your line manager but provide a buddy somebody who is going to take the time to you know give opportunities for questions to be asked you know I mentioned psychological safety is one of the main things we do as core impact give the opportunities, provide opportunities for people to ask the silly questions or the silly questions, because there's no such thing, you know, um, give them the opportunity to ideally meet the highest ranking member of the, either the region they work within or the department or ideally the company. And that doesn't necessarily, I'll tell you where I thought was a really good example and something we're working with organizations to try and achieve now is um, VR. Um, does anyone have any background in VR or have come in touch with VR or have any experiences of it? Deadly silence. <laughs> Sandra says, not me. <laughs> no? Okay. I'll assume that everybody has no, uh, not that I'm an expert, but what I, I, I came across an opportunity that we're looking into for actual VR training. Okay, and it's going a little step further than what we're talking about, that synchronous and asynchronous, both in person or uh, at home. And uh, the idea around, you know, having either headsets that are set in one room that you can provide training. Now, what I thought this fit in really well when I was thinking about this was, um, you know, if you were doing an onboarding, how amazing would it be to have, of course, you might have a CEO or, or a chief financial officer or whoever the highest ranking member of the organization is, you know, what about if you've done something that you, somebody may put a VR headset on and as part of their induction, they are sitting in a virtual room where that person is there full bodied and they're encouraging them to do their best and, and, and introducing them to themselves and the rest of the company and, and letting them know what part they play. Um, and I think that's one of the ways we can do it. Now, obviously in person, I believe is always the best way. But when you're working with teams across seas or you're working with teams who are some in the office, some not in the office, you know, that might be a nice in-between um, and virtually can doesn't have to be VR, virtual reality. It can be virtually online as well that you can jump on calls with. And I can tell you that the best organizations, the ones with the best culture are the ones who take the time to at least provide an opportunity so many times throughout the year that 
um, somebody has access or at least hears directly from the, the CEO. Now, thousands of employees, fair enough, um, but you can still do uh, really nice ways of, of kind of communicating from, from that, say, that, that level of the, the organization. Um, Sandra's never heard of VR or online being used in that way. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? Um, I'm probably giving you away some secrets that we're trying to implement. <laughs> um, so that's something we're really seriously looking into. Um, we're engaged with a company already who understand that, uh, that, that that's an opportunity. And I know, I do know of a few examples of companies, actually a couple of law firms here in Northern Ireland who are looking into doing VR for inductions. So um, yeah, and what actually is interesting about that is, you know, it's, it, they can simulate the types of like, you know, as solicitors or barristers, you know, when you're junior and you want to get more experience, there's very little real life simulations that you can have, whereas VR could create a fully comprehensive um, sort of, if you say this, this is said back to you, if you say that, this is said back to you, um, and it can provide upskilling opportunities for people. So that's that's just something to consider as well. Um, so when you're looking at the employee journey, okay, and this is where I think the, the challenges come into play with virtual and not virtual, okay? Because as James rightly said, they found in his last organization, um, I think he said that, um, <laughs> that the, the turnover was high because they tried to do onboarding virtually and that they've found that the retention is better whenever it's in person, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't achieve positive results um, from virtual and in-person, a blend of sort of onboarding. Um, but it's not an easy answer. And, and so what we done was we considered the, the employee journey as a whole. And what we like to do with each of these boxes, if you imagine their touch points, okay? So in leadership, I believe that if you break everything down into touch points, you can have a, a more impactful leadership style, okay? And better outcomes as a whole, okay? What that means is to me, you know, if you use, I don't know if you've ever heard that Maya Angelou um, quote of people won't remember what you did, people won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel, you know, and, and everything I do, I try to encourage that. That's why I try to be as interactive as possible. So that's a, these are touch points. This is a touch point, this workshop for me, you know, but when you're working with individuals, you know, right from the point of the advertisement going out there, let's face it, that's going to be in a virtual setting. They're probably going to see that online, unlike the back, back in the day, you know, people don't just go to the newspapers now to see any adverts. They see it all virtually. So people are already not native. Young people are native to it. They're only used to the technology. But for anybody who isn't native to technology, they're well used to it by now. The majority of workers in, at, the, at the moment, okay? So like I said, have a buddy, have somebody from that moment that they move from recruitment into induction and the onboarding, provide that opportunity for them to feel part of the organization. And the VR is one of those aspects. In that induction process, I believe that if you could figure out a way to use VR or even just videos directly, but two-way communication, something that it's not just a video that's hit play and that uh, somebody can't speak back to them. Some level that uh, the, sen the most senior person you can get will provide that opportunity for people to be bought in. Um, and at that point, you know, when we're supporting organizations with inductions and onboarding, we're trying to explain to them, you know, you need to treat this as an opportunity for them to feel their part in the overall company. And again, this comes back to the whole idea around hybrid working. You know, how do you get everyone to feel that what they're doing actually has an impact on the outputs of the overall organization? So if you remember that the whole organization is a big machine, lots of different cogs, you know, if you can figure out a way, whatever way you do it, that you can make somebody feel that, oh, by the way, if you turn and you do what you're meant to do and you put the outputs out that we expect, this is the impact that it's going to have in your team. This is the impact that will have in that, that part of the company. Therefore, the whole company's success is bridged on how well you work. If you can provide that, that accountability from the get-go, you're laughing. Now, how do you do that in a hybrid environment? You have to do a bit of a mix. Ideally, I wouldn't say you do uh, one recruitment drive completely virtually and one recruitment drive in person. Um, a bit of a mix, you know, different touch points because then you're blending the approach and the outcomes. Like James says, if you do it virtually online, the case study he's given an example of, the turnover was high. So with that in mind, then why don't you just mix it up a wee bit? Sometimes maybe you can just meet out in person. You don't have to be formal when it comes to inductions. Remember that you can meet outside um, in a park and you could have an opportunity to walk and talk um, just to say hello. And I can tell you that from 
you know, working with organizations all the time, those little in-person kind of contacts really, really help. But if it's not possible, there are different platforms that you can use, okay? So you can use platforms uh, like Nearpod. You can use platforms, um, excuse me, I don't know if you call it VR City. There's a platform I've seen called Teo, T-E-E-O-H. Has anyone come across that before? I will assume not if you haven't chirped in. <laughs> um, well, if you if you have, you'll see that um, TO is a virtual setting. Now it's all on your computer, um, but what you could do is you could actually do an induction and why they're not with you in person, there's a bit of crack with it. You know, there's a bit of uh, personality put into it and they actually see their little icon and they can move about in this area. It's kind of like a game um, and that gamification studies show people become more engaged. And it's something different and it provides that opportunity. So that may be something that bridges the gap between the in-person um, but also the, the virtual and, and having something that meets in the middle. When it comes to training and development, let's face it, e-learning is the future anyway. So opportunities to learn are usually done online. Um, but you can blend that. You can use those platforms like I just mentioned, like Nearpod or Quizlet, um, you know, where it's a live example based on what's happening in the company at the time and that you have to try and figure out a way to get everyone engaged uh, with the content that's going on. And it, it's real life, real time. It's, it's providing an opportunity for people to see the active things that they'll actually come up against moving forward. Um, and, and it's a nice way of doing it. Again, from the opportunities perspective, whether it's they're searching for it or you're providing the development in terms of opportunities, again, lots of that's going to be online moving forward now anyway. So trying to find that mix is probably the best way. And with growth, you know, I believe, from a hybrid working perspective, you're going to have to, in terms of those development and move growing your people, um, you're going to have to teach them and learn ourselves, actually, um, teach ourselves and, and learn from uh, the platforms that are out there because using uh, uh, technology isn't going to go away. It's only going to become more inclusive. It's only going to be more encouraged uh, as we move forward. So conscious of time, okay? So some tips around that will help is basically that environment that I mentioned already, but it's for them individually. And it's taking the time as a leader to say, actually, this is what we suggest you do, or based on your requirements, this is what we think. Um, and that's one step closer to creating that extended version, that virtual version of them working in, at home, but still working for the organization. Self-care, and I'll drill this home all day long. And, um, you know, there's a silent pandemic, especially in Northern Ireland anyway. I don't know what the South is like statistically, but I know that Northern Ireland is terrible when it comes to the, the, the rise in suicides and, and mental health issues. And it's really important to highlight that. Um, don't shy away from it whenever you're trying to create a hybrid working environment. If anything, you should be more on the ball because you might not see your people there. And I think that that's a key component in making sure people feel welcome and that you're taking the time to say it is okay not to be okay. Um, and while I, as a manager, may not have all the answers, um, I will certainly showcase or, or display the, the information that you need and, and point you in the right direction to anybody that can help. Most organizations are starting to do uh, training in mental health awareness and mental health first aid. And it's really exciting to see that um, because we, we will, and we do actually currently have major issues throughout all organizations where people are just stressed. It's the number one reason why people take time off and it always has been. And um, providing options for home and office working where possible. So again, just drilling home again. If you can, let people choose because that room for freedom, you know, not saying, and I, I have come across organizations who said, no, we can't, we can't allow them to do that. We can't allow them to work from home. And it's, you know, when I'm asking them, well, why? You know, they're saying, well, we put a lot of money and investment into our offices. And that's fair. That is fair. I get that from an organizational kind of objectives perspective and, and costs. I get that. But for the longevity of the organization, maybe it's worth selling part of the offices. And I've seen organizations do that. And those examples I mentioned of like Amazon and Facebook and, you know, the forward thinking companies, the biggest companies, um, they have given those opportunities. People who really want to work in an office setting, they can. And some organizations have just closed all offices. And here in Northern Ireland, I've heard examples of that as well, where they've just said there's no point. It's actually more effective to do it um, uh, remotely. 
yeah, and as, as Sandra says, that's exactly what's happened to them. And then that's okay, you know, because then you have to really consider these elements, you know, how you can bridge the gap between virtual and non-virtual. Um, I do think that you do always have to have the in-person if possible, you know, maybe even once a year, because like I know people who have worked for large organizations, American based companies who work here in Northern Ireland and they never get to meet their team um, uh, throughout the year bar the one time. And, and you'll see the best companies will provide opportunities pre and during, not, maybe not during, sorry, uh, pre and post COVID, they prov they're providing opportunities for them to fly over, to see each other, to spend a week together, get to know each other and just bridge that gap and build, build the relationships. So do encourage also people to work independently as well as part of a team because they are skills that they will need moving forward, especially if you're looking at that employee journey and you're trying to increase their skills and their development. Um, and I've mentioned a few platforms, but one example that I wanted to give you was the uh, Google Jamboard. Have you ever used that? I just took a screenshot earlier on. <laughs> Um, have you ever used Jamboards? Yeah, I have. We use Google yeah. Suite. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And how do you find it? Do you use it regularly? Probably not as regularly because we, we do have other kind of functionalities that we kind of use and um, project management tools and everything else. Um, you know, it, it's not kind of on our massive list to use in all yeah. fairness. Yeah. No, well, that, that, that's good. It's good to hear that. I, I, do, you, do you just use it in a meeting function usually then, or would you have a live sort of example? Kind of, yeah, we generally kind of do um, with that. And we kind of use, I suppose, if we're doing any ideas, bouncing any ideas about it, it'll be a case of people can put in post-its and put up their own notes and stuff like that. We leave it open and use it that way for like more so ideas boards and process flows and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's and do you know what? It's it's in the, it's one of those tools that you can use. There's many, there's many that are out there. Um, you know, I've mentioned some of them, Nearpod, Quizlet. Um, you know, mm -hmm. look these ones up. They're they're really good. Now, Nearpod and stuff, they they go in more interactive. You can actually play games together and have wee quizzes and sort of you know if you're ever uh, uh, providing opportunities for meetings, you know, it's one thing you can encourage people to jump on during the meeting. But I, I like Jamboards because it's really simple. It's just so simple to use and people get it very quickly, especially you see that share button at the top there. You know, you can set it up where you just share it out. As long as somebody has the link, they click on the link, it brings them straight onto the page. And if you have the right settings set up, which are very simple, they can pick between these. This is the wee sticky note one, which I think is the best one. Um, but they can also put in text, they can draw, they can add images into it. And um, as Hazel says there, you know, you can have it as a process um, as well. So look, that, that's just one example and I'm, I'm conscious of time. What I will say is obviously we're meant to finish up with three, um, but if there are questions and it's okay with the team from Glandor, um, I'm happy to answer questions if it goes past that time, okay? So look, based on everything we, we've mentioned here, okay, it all comes back to organizational culture, you know, and, and the problem with culture is it's hard to change and um, the, the, the actual invisible looks, or the, the invisible elements of it. So the artifacts, the behaviors and the metrics Yes, you can see them and it's easier to change them then, but the, the embedded values and the embedded beliefs, they are things that are harder to impact. Um, I can see Mary says that's they're, they're happy to stay on if anyone has any questions and keep the conversation going a wee bit, you know. So with, with that in mind, what I wanted to do was just very quickly and very quickly, just in case anyone wants it, it is recorded. And um, I just wanted to kind of go through it. Now, again, most people kind of heard here the, the term culture. Um, but they, they don't necessarily know what it means. And I think that when you're looking at hybrid working, if you focus on, um, uh, at, on the culture elements, you know, I keep talking about touch points. That's what I'm referring to. I'm talking about the culture. How do you build the culture in, a, in an environment where some people are working from home, some in person and vice versa when they're coming in and out of the office? And I think if you focus on these five areas, you're not going to go too far wrong using the content that are there. And I'll very quickly run through them, okay? Just firstly, though, the... The organizational culture elements are the values and the behaviors that contribute to the unique and psychological environment of an organization. So it's basically like when you walk into your restaurant <laughs> and it's like quarter past nine at night and they're meant to close at 10 and the, the, the waiter or waitress rolls their eyes because you've just walked in, right? Has anybody ever come across that before? I'm assuming you have at one time or another before closing time. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what I find is it's really difficult not to feel the not judgment but the the, the behaviors or the, the feeling that comes from that that's a culture you're feeling a culture and that doesn't mean that that's the way the place works all the time but you're getting a, a gist of that 
And five areas that are easy to work on when it comes to culture are strategy, which are your vision, your values, and your goals. So if you're looking from a hybrid working perspective, focus on what the company's trying to achieve. And then the core values, the core values are the attitudes, the behaviors. And in the induction process, you need to figure out a way to embed those values in the induction process and the recruitment process, sorry. Um, so you need to make sure that in the interviews, you're in encouraging uh, the types of questions that lead to answers that blend well with your values. That's what you're trying to achieve. And if you can do that, then you're going to get a little bit of uh, engagement built up. If you get the engagement build up, then, built up, then people are probably more bought in and they get a bit more excited about working for your company. Therefore, they'll go the extra mile. So, you know, if you very basically, if you go the extra mile for your team, they will go the extra mile for you. Um, and then that follows up with goals and, and, and targets. And what I will say about recruitment processes, especially in hybrid working, everybody comes into an organization motivated. You know, you may right now be able to give me examples of people you work with that you wouldn't say out loud, but maybe you, you work with who aren't very motivated or to people within your team who don't perform as well as others. But what I would say is, and this is kind of bringing it back to you and the, the processes within the organization, especially the hybrid working environment, you know, how are you providing opportunities for them to stay motivated? Because somebody doesn't come into your organization be motivated. Something happens across the, the, the along the way, along that employee journey that I mentioned. And in hybrid working, that's where, especially remote working, that's where people fall short. They're, they don't take the time to consider the touch points. After that, you have leaders. And it's not just formal leaders, it's informal leaders. It's people who have influence within the organization. And it always starts with the leaders but try and consider how you can utilize people within your team who may not be responsible, uh, sorry, informal responsible roles that are accountable to outputs, but they may have influence in the team for the positive or the negative. Try and switch the negative into the positive and give them opportunity and instill a wee bit of motivation into them. And if you do that, they'll make life easier for you. You know, when before you jump onto your MS Teams call or you jump onto your Google Chats or Meets, um, you know, they, they could be starting a conversation around what you're doing. So keep them in the loop. Communication, straight across the board, we've already talked about it. It's so key to your organization's success with culture. Um, but that feedback element, that's where I wanted to highlight. Make sure that you're providing feedback to your team as well as they uh, are offering feedback to you. You know, speak to them. Nobody knows better than your team. They ask them how you can create an environment that makes them feel included. And if there's nothing else you take away from today, it's that. Ask your team how you can create a better environment for them to work within, whether it's remote and in person. Because if you ask them and they tell you and you try it, even if it doesn't work, they feel a sense of responsibility. So they will try and figure out ways as a, a, a combined goal. Or they'll try and think, figure out ways to get to that combined goal of, of a successful culture within a hybrid working environment. Motivation. Give people opportunities always, whether it's in person or off site, always give people opportunities to showcase what they can do and see if it's not within their respective role and skills that they should have and display within their role. Then it should be on uh, another part of the organization. And that's where job rotation or, or job enlargement or whatever way you want to look at it, uh, business terms, uh, give them opportunities elsewhere. And I've seen this work in practice, especially through the pandemic. And it's been fantastic. There's people who have created roles within organizations that weren't there that are specifically designed around hybrid working and, and creating those touch points. And then lastly, just the mindset, like I said, make sure that you're providing an opportunity for people to feel psychologically safe. I think we've all been in an environment at one time or another where you were afraid to say, I don't know how to do this six months or even six years into a job. Like, I don't know how to do that aspect of the job. And the, the businesses feel you if that's the case. So provide, excuse me, that opportunity for people to feel as though they can put their hand up and ask the quote unquote stupid question. Because FYI, there are no stupid questions. Um, and if you create that as a leader, your team will buy in. And if they buy in, then you'll have what we call the, um, the impact success model success. Okay, so essentially this, those five areas that I mentioned, if you create that opportunity through what we call engagement, enablement, and empowerment, these are the fruits of your labor. These are the things that people will take away, and this, this is what the organization will get out of it. And, you know, things like care and positivity, reten retention of your people, like James had said there, the, this does work. I've seen it in practice, especially in hybrid working environments. 
and that's me. <laughs> I'll stop talking now. I was five minutes over. Apologies. And there was just some nice conversations in there that I wanted to, to kind of maximize. But, you know, so I've, I've given a few tips. I've, given, I've looked at a wee bit of culture. I've looked at how teams can work, hopefully, and um, you find. Um, but what I'd like to do is just if there's something that didn't come up that you would like to have a quick chat about or something that you'd like more information on, um, please let me know. Please